anyone watching this another time uh, by video, um, I'm Brandon, and this is? I'm Morag. And welcome to Conflict Done Well Dojo. Um, we operate by agreements, and um, we take care of ourselves and let the group know if there's something going on with us um, so that other people can, can know what's up and learn to describe and notice that sort of thing about other people and about themselves. And uh, like in all dojos, we practice with each other. And one of the, since we're practicing how to work through difference and how to be in conflict, um, conflicts within ourselves are no less um, legitimate places to learn than anywhere else. So we take care of ourselves and let other people know what's going on so they can join in, stay away, choose distance, that sort of thing. And we um, welcome everybody. So everyone is welcome because of the ways in which we're different rather than in spite of it. Um, and by everyone, we mean everybody. And then um, we also agree that these videos will be released. And uh, it's possible to pull them back, but um, not possible to guarantee that they didn't go anywhere in the meantime, based on the nature of the internet. So we participate with that in mind. And we bring things up and out that are um, appropriate to uh, work with so that they won't be overwhelming. Sometimes big stuff comes up. But, um, we try to be mindful about how we bring it into what will eventually be in the public sphere. Um, is there anything, Morag, about those agreements and that sort of thing that has occurred to you that is odd or needs to be expressed differently to be better understood or anything like that? I yeah, asked I that. yeah, I think it's great to uh, put that out there at the beginning and the whole idea of taking responsibility for ourselves while sharing and being open to other viewpoints is great and managing the conflict within ourselves so that we can manage conflict with other people yeah completely aligned with all that yeah and it's good to just spell it out at the beginning so that we're mindful of that from the start of the practice lovely uh, and um applying our um practice to that would be practicing it uh, rather than simply saying it or telling people they should do it um, is to say is to say it out loud and figure out if that is in fact what how we're operating um, so that um, the things we do over and over that invariably create habits in us create habits that we're happy about later rather than habits that we look back on and think why in the world didn't I realize I was doing that over and over again um, and that's part of uh, where we're headed today is um, we're working we're, we've been working on place and location as a uh, as a next step, we worked on structure and um, support as our as our first long um, theme after coming back. And um, placement has to do with where you imagine something happening and where it literally occurring, and the relationship between the the literal place and the metaphorical context in which something is held. And um, in order to do that with our bodies, we've been moving in the direction of uh, technique and taught and how we communicate uh, based on which, which movement of our body we choose, which movement of our mind, which kind of language we choose um, with the idea the basic tenet of martial nonviolence. One of the basic ones is everything communicates. And so um, as I do something with my body, I am giving myself a message and you a message and a potential observer participant a message and usually several. And it's impossible to keep them all under control, but it is possible to notice them um, and notice more and more of them and participate in the decision-making that goes into what kind of communication we're, do, we're practicing at the moment. Um, and, Marshall Rosenberg would say um, nonviolent communication. Um, and uh, our question for that is what kind of nonviolence? Because there's lots of ways to imagine that. And we're borrowing Marshall as a metaphor and then saying, well, what does that mean exactly? And um, I'll say one last thing about that and then ask you for thoughts. And then we'll just move around some and I'll stop talking. Um, when I say Marshall, what I mean is, in, in part, um, learned over time uh, with conflict in mind 
so that we are habituating ourselves to a particular set of responses that range from the basic to the extremely sophisticated um, and which are somatic, which is to say with no imagined divide between body and mind, um, but un understood and practiced whole so that we're thinking and moving and feeling and expressing and exploring and choosing um, all in the moment. And having conflict in mind means um, practicing it so that it can be done under real circumstances, under pressure, when the stakes are high, things like that. Whereas some concepts of nonviolence are extremely passive. And uh, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying this is different from that, is that we, we will choose to be still and choose to be calm and choose to breathe carefully and that sort of thing. But it is not uh, a basic fantasy of passivity that allows us to do that. It is a fantasy of activity that we choose to engage that. We, it's a creative process rather than a withdrawal. So I guess really the martial artist keeps all their options open strategically and tactically, whereas a lot of nonviolent responses foreclose specific options because they are imagined as too much or inappropriate or, and that's fair. In some cases they are, and it's, then it's important to focus on that, but that's not our project. So thoughts? Yeah, I love it. I completely aligned with that. Um, <clears throat> The idea of I'm just scribbling away as usual with my notes as you were speaking, and um, uh, it brings up this sort of idea of excellence while we're on autopilot. We've got we're practicing to program our autopilot to be excellent in coordinating um, the whole body response automatically. So it's mind, body, spirit is totally aligned with the choice and the openness of having lots of choices and practicing with lots of choices of whether the choice is going to be momentary stillness before a movement or whether the choice is going to be um, 90 degrees drop to the floor or if it's going to be a spiral or whatever it's going to be but being able to make skillful choices <laughs> in a split second so we are peacekeeping force so we don't have to use any of the um, uh, stronger physical practices necessarily um, but they are there as backup for when we think oh right at this moment we really do need to uh, you know drop our center ground ourselves and you know take our partner with us very strongly or there may be a time when we wait for our partner to catch up with us or um, and all those things can only arise by repetition, 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 physically. Um, and discussing it as well, so we're aware of the uh, mental and spiritual equivalence as well, so that it's a whole package of mind, body, spirit response in the moment, in the most skillful, protective, helpful way for both people, for all people. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds good to me. Yeah, and um, I would I would add um, a little a nuance um, that you alluded to, but I would I'd like to pull it out a little bit, and that is that um, a lot of martial arts explicitly practice dominance and maximum harm as soon as possible. And um, I think there are circumstances in which that could be appropriate, but I think they are few and far between. Um, and that if you, um, rather, than, especially when we're talking about the psychological aspects of communication, rather than the actual response to a physical attack, um, moving for dominance right away as a habit um, forecloses, a, in, frequently forecloses the option that will actually lead to everybody getting what they need and a shot at what they want, which is when conflict ends. 
So you end up perpetuating the conflict endlessly uh, by immediately having, having a knee-jerk move for dominance right away. And one of the ways that Aikido, um, obviously on which martial nonviolence is based, um, helps to somaticize that is that um, I move for connection to the partner. I move to allow the partner their natural movement. I add a drop to it because they're literally attacking me, but I don't necessarily bury them in such a way that they will never get up again. And I certainly am committed to not to doing a minimum amount of harm rather than a maximum amount of harm. So I exercise appropriate authority and control over my sphere. I keep myself in my structure. This I'm practicing being in control of, and I'm practicing connecting to you so that if you insist on impinging on me, you move in a way that I don't lose my center. But, I, but I, I'm looking more for the also true martial position of, well, let's see what happens, rather than I am now going to crush all enemies. So I'm, I'm, I don't have and will not have control over all of the elements in my sphere of influence. And fantasies of control are what get me personally, and I suspect other people into some serious trouble. So my question for me is, how can I continually create options and then make clear in which direction I would like to head without dominating you so that you have fewer options and are forced to follow the thing that I want to do? And again, if somebody tries to literally attack my body, I, I will give them only one spot to go. And that's a very different thing than if someone says you're an asshole. It's very different than if they're actually punching you in the face. Though my body feels similarly, I feel attacked and my body does some of the same stuff. So it's practicing the difference between those similar in one way and very different in another way relations so that I can differentiate them and not respond to you psychologically as though you were attacking me physically when in fact you are not. Thank you. Yes, that's a very useful point to make. The physical attack and the verbal attack require different responses. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it, that's an answer to the question too that I've, I've gotten a couple of times in the last several months, which is why Aikido? Can't you put any martial art in there? And my response was, well, it depends on how you're practicing it. I've seen Tai Chi, for instance, practiced in a very yang kind of extremely dangerous, this is no question about it, this is a martial art happening to me sort of way. And I've also seen it practiced in a way that you, it creates an impenetrable sphere that you just can't get in. And every time you touch, you lose your balance. And it's, you know, the, its roots are probably in parallel with the roots of jujitsu and other things like that. I mean, it's not a, we have two arms and two legs and a head and a torso. I mean, it's, you know, there are only so many ways this can move, but my my answer to the Aikido question is that yeah, but Aikido is a specific derivation of Jujitsu in which the gestalt of the entire application is changed. So that when you attack me, I demonstrate rather than fighting with you. And what I'm demonstrating is how I can keep my center while you fall down, and I don't put you in the hospital or the or the morgue. And that's really important. And there's Nathan. He's connecting to audio. I can hear my son talking to his grandmother up the stairs. Let me remind him. Hi, Nathan. We've just started. <laughs> okay, yeah, I was messing around. Nathan! <laughs> Brendan, sorry. I joined without the link. It just wasn't working. Howdy. Um, all right. Are you seeing and hearing us? I'm, you're, you're breaking up a bit. This is Morag. Yeah, Morag. See, I see David Mark. Oh, there he went. Oh, it's gone. We lost him. His connection seemed a bit dodgy. Yeah, while he's doing that, let's let's warm up a little bit. So when he comes back, he can just join us at that part since we've already talked and talked. <clears throat> yep.
and breathing in as much as you can, getting as big as you can, breathing in lots and lots, really filling your space and getting small and breathing out. And getting really big and letting your imagination go out to what you can see and what you can hear and what you can smell, the edge of what your senses can do and then what you remember and imagine about what goes beyond that because you know what's beyond the walls in your area. And then small again. And keep your cycle of breath going the whole time. And put your hands down and shoot your feet out. Drop your weight in the middle and airplane your arms. Yeah. Down dog. And knees down, stretch your toes, rock your heels back and forth. Take your belly down and your nose up or wag your tail so you can feel the stretch on both sides. And then arch your back and look at your belly. And take your knees out to the side so the soles of your feet touch and you're stretching your hips forward. And pressing back, stretching the tops of your feet forward. You stretch your lower back and your hips and back. And long legs, pushing up in the front, turning and looking behind you and letting your hips turn as you stretch your lower back all the way up into your shoulders. And let yourself down. Reach out with your right hand and take your left foot behind you until you stretch your right shoulder. Arms out to three and nine, down leg to six, head to 12, and then your leg goes behind you until you stretch all the way across your back. And switch to the other side. And pull your arm through and roll onto your back. Hands out to three and nine, palm down. Take your left foot to the right side. And look to your left. And switch. And legs back in the middle. And relax yourself and try to get your center to release. So if you're clenching in your hips or your belly, and then moving out from there into your legs and your lower and upper back. If you're clenching anywhere, try to release it. And wiggle your hips just a little bit so that movement helps you to release and relax. Check and see if you're breathing generously so that your belly swells and falls. And then reach out through your hands and your feet so that they, your legs and arms start to lift off the ground. And then your head lift up to the top of your head so everything floats. And then put everything gently back down again and check to see if you can release and relax your core and any bits of you that are clenched. You're just going to lift your feet as you're going to extend your legs and your arms and your neck so that your head, hands, and feet come off the floor, but you're not lifting up so much as pushing or extending out. So out, and everything comes up, and then everything goes by down and relaxes. From your core, start your movement down in your middle, and let everything reach out and up, and back down again. And then at your own pace, you'll want to keep doing that with a full release at the end so you're checking to see if you are clenching. And the job is to be able to activate everything from the middle without clenching and shoving. And your breath continues.
And then coming up to sitting and feel your core and extend your head so that your back is straight and rock back and forth a little bit and pull your heels toward you and rock. And put your hands in the air and rock. And then pick your feet up and rock. And put them back down again and pull your heels one more time. Let your head lift up and bring your flat back forward by taking your shoulders out. So you're not going nose down yet. You're just taking your, your sternum forward while your head lifts up and your spine along. And then shoot your feet out. So your heels go away from you and wiggle your toes and rock a little bit. And then lift up to the top of your head and reach past your feet. Let your hands drop and without taking your nose down, let your head continue to lift up and pull your shoulders toward your toes. And then separate your legs. And do the same thing in the middle, reaching out rather than curling down. And to go to your left side, and pull your nose toward your toes without curling your back. And then go to the other side. And then rotate your torso so you're looking up underneath your arm. Grab your foot with your elbow on the inside of your knee and reach up with that hand and over. And then to the other side. All right. And we're gonna do roly polies a little bit. So your job is to go straight, put your hand on the ground to your three or nine, doesn't really matter which. And as you go out, your body was going to be in a 90 degree angle and you're going to open your legs like a book like this. And you're going to go across your back and sit up and then back the other direction. So your hand goes to 90 and your legs make a 180 degree change. Side, over, up, side, over, up. And you can keep going in whatever direction you have room. Keep breathing, go across your back and sitting up. Good. Sometimes I pause to look so I can just get a sense of what everybody's doing, but you can keep going. I'm going to try to give verbal cues every time I move forward, like usual, just to try to. Let everybody have their own space. And then pull your feet through, sit on your bottom, pull your feet through, stretch your toes again. And then sit Kiza with your toes curled and pressure on the ball of the foot. And then Seiza with your feet flat. And then come all the way up onto your knees and take one of your feet to the side and put the heel down. Put the other foot in Kiza behind you so that you have your toes down and stretch into the foot that reaches away while you're going down into the foot that's underneath you. And then come straight back up again. Switch which side is out and which side is under and then shoot that out foot further out and squish those toes underneath. All right, and then pull your feet underneath you and roll up onto your, the ball of your foot. And using your center, put your knees down on the floor again, and then roll them back up again, and push down with your heels so that your head goes straight up. All right. And bend your knees right underneath your shoulders. You make sure your knees are bent. And straighten one leg while the other knee bends. 
and notice what happens to your hips. So one leg straightens, the other knee bends, and let that go ahead and roll up into your shoulders and swing your arms around, bending one, straightening the other. Try to leave your head right in the middle so it looks toward the camera. Check and see if you're breathing independently of your movement. And try to make sure that your cycle of breath is full and generous and has its own independent movement. Okay, drop one arm across your body and then stretch the shoulder all the way into the back. And then same arm behind you. And without letting your head go forward, you're gonna keep your head up and independent of your head, you're gonna pull your elbow behind your, behind your head. That's so independent. And then you're gonna pull it across and down. And then you're gonna lean in the direction you're pulling and reach out and go around in circles, shifting your weight from one foot to the other foot so that your weight and your hands are on the same side of the body. And then stopping at the top and letting your arms drop. Other side. Behind across and down, independent of the head. Pulling across and down, and then leaning, and then reaching, and then hands and the feet, shifting your weight. And stop the top, and drop your hands. And drop your chin to your chest, and roll your head side to side. And then leave your ear on your shoulder and nod while you reach in the opposite direction. And then press down and cock you, extend out and back. And roll everything down and forward into the other side, nodding in one direction, reaching in the opposite, and pressing down while you nod. Coqu, extend out through the edge and back. Hands forward, head side to side. And let your head hang in front and bend your knees to bring your head gently on top of your column so that you have one, you have a straight back. And shake your hands and shake your shoulders until it changes your ribs and your breathing. And shake your face and shake your butt. And shake your feet and your legs. And take your hips around in a big circle like you're stirring a bowl, leaving your head right where it is. And go the other direction. All right. Um, each of you, um, could, would you like to suggest one exercise that your body might be really in need of or that you really enjoy and we haven't done yet or something like that? Um, maybe we could do um, a forward lunge with the back foot in Kiza, toes tucked under, and the lovely. front knee as a right angle with the foot flat on the floor, the ankle up. I'm in a small, yeah, like that. <laughs> yeah, stepping back and then forwards. And then the other one I think you did last week, Brandon, was stepping forwards into it and then stepping back. So stepping forwards to come out of it. Sometimes so you come, so you come sometimes stepping up. backwards out of it. Yeah. Nice. And stepping backwards into it, I suppose. There's another aspect of it. And also, I think we did stepping out at two and ten and four and eight. We say stepping out offline and then stepping up back to the centre, stepping offline backwards and up to the centre. Nice. Right. Thank okay, you. Nathan. 
Anything in particular? Um, I never done it, but maybe you could show. But I was thinking like some kind of breathing where we breathe like fully, but through everything, like chest, diaphragm, everything at once, but in stages. I don't know. I just made that up. Sure. I don't know how to do it though. <laughs> okay, well, the way that I know to do it is you use your imagination because you can't literally breathe into your legs, right? Yeah. But you you move the part that you're thinking about. So we're gonna start with our toes in the bottom of our foot and you're gonna move your toes and you're going to press your foot on the floor and then move your other the, your weight in the foot so that the skin does this. And the fantasy is that you'll breathe in to the part that I mentioned and you'll do a whole breath in and then a whole breath out while you're trying to feel the inner workings of whatever it is that we're, you know, as we stack. Okay. That make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah, so well, not, not exactly, but yes. <laughs> and we're going to breathe out first and then allow a natural full in-breath until it stops. And we're going to hold it at the bottom. So when all the breath is gone and we pushed it all out, you hold the breath out. And then you hold the breath in just for a moment of pause at the top. So I bend my knees. I wiggle my toes. I feel the skin of the bottom of my foot. And I breathe into it by pulling out while I'm reaching with my attention for it, all the way out, hold, and then allow an in-breath. And then you move your ankles around and you can feel the effect on the top of your feet. So it's not so much pushing your feet back and forth so you feel the bottom of the skin, but you're feeling the top of the foot the muscles that go straight, the muscles that go straight down the line of the bone to the toes. And you're moving the ankles by moving the feet and the leg and the breath. And you're bringing the the ball of the foot off the ground so you can feel your calf and the Achilles tendon. And you're moving your knees around so you can feel the, the sides of the, of the calf tense and release and relax. We're gonna do the knees separately. So this is just the calf, the, the part of the leg between the knee and the, and the ankle. Breathing. Out, all the way. Pause. So I may not have said out loud, but when you get to the top of the breath in, obviously you pause and then you let everything out again. Then you get back to equilibrium. Now the knees. So you can also do this in Seiza. You can do it while stretching that particular bit, while massaging that particular bit. This is stolen from acupressure, uh, which is not my area of expertise, but uh, you know, workshops. So there's a, there's a, um, you can stretch it, you can breathe into it under pressure. You can totally isolate it and take all the pressure away. You can massage it during that time. You can cool it, you can heat it. There's all kinds of cool stuff you can do that's not feel better, feel better when something is damaged or you know weird or out of kilter or whatever. And as is my want, I'm gonna propose you can also do this psychologically, that you can figure out what it is that's cramped, stuck, uncomfortable, imbalanced, upset, whatever, and you can load it. You can, you know, that's, that's, that's a really big deal. It's, you know, it's the, it's the linchpin. If I can't get this figured out, then I, or you can unload it and say, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. You know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to put that aside and bracket it and not worry about it. And you can stress test it. You can totally release it. You can prod it a little bit and try to figure out how it works. There's all kinds of ways that our physical structures and our psychological structures are the same system, which is basically what somatic means, and this is a somatic discipline. So as, I guess the reason I'm mentioning that now is that as we're doing this, we're always drawing parallels with, without any more evidence than our own experience between how we physically operate and how we psychologically operate, so that every possible connection that we can find that then we can find out if it's legitimate or not. We can test our imagination because if I can change this and suddenly I feel differently, 
at least I know for sure that that's something that's going on in me, even if it, I, it, I may not be able to extend it to humanity, but you know, there's, there's a way that what I do physically and how I feel about it are intimately related and changing one changes the other. Otherwise there would not be behavioral psychology and things like that. So um, knees. So we're bending them. We're going to put a little bit of pressure on them, but not a whole lot of weight. And we're going to move them from side to side and forward and back so that our attention really becomes all about the knees. That's really what this movement is for, so that we're participating in the knee individually inside. You know, you're working the knees and breathing. You can also stop moving anytime you want if your attention feels satisfactorily knee oriented all the way out. And then when the natural in breath comes, the exploratory movement also lubricates the joint and the area so that you get that if you had just done that movement without the breath, it still would have lubricated. But when you're doing it at the same time, it gives you the idea that you're in charge or participating in the process, which then puts triggers in so that you can just cause things to lubricate without having to do as much movement. Um, the area between the knees and the hips. So you're looking to get this. You're going to go up on your toes and you're going to you're going to cl clutch your glutes so that you can feel the tension in the front of the leg. You're going to release and do the hamstring stretch. You're going to drop and you're going to feel how your movement, movement of your hips and your back affect your upper leg, the calf. And breathing out. And your butt and your and just the first little bit of your lower back. We're going to do those together because otherwise that gets a little confusing. You're also going to do your hip girdle so it comes around the front. There's a lot of stuff going on in there, but we need to move forward. So if you just put your hands on your butt, the, the, the butt, the heel of your hand rests more or less where your waist will be. So you can feel your butt as long as it's not too far down. And you do the same thing, you can rest it. Your hips are actually not this, but in here. And so you're going to feel where your hips hinge and how it comes up, but not your belly, but underneath your belly button by about an inch and a half, there's a line. And a, a belt can be helpful in figuring out where it is. And you're going to move that stuff around and separate it and bring it back together again and move it independently and breathe into it. <laughs> And now we're finally reaching the area that really is belly and breath directly related. And you are swishing stuff down. You are changing the period, the, the area of your diaphragm, but it's underneath the sternum and, and, and just below the belly button. It's this radial mass. Okay, now we're doing sternum. Again, ton of stuff going on up here. We're not doing arms, we're gonna do separately. So we're doing this box um, just below the sternum to where the clavicles rest. So not the neck and not the arms, but this box right here. And we're gonna do, we're gonna get into that by moving other stuff. So we're gonna do neck and head and stuff in a minute. So it's this part. Can you move this part while the rest of this more or less stays? And of course the answer is not really, but. The fantasy is that we're working on this. Okay, and then we're going to do the arms together rather than separately, though, of course, you can do them separately. You can also do shoulder isolation, 
bicep, just like we did the legs, but we're kind of running out of time. So shoulders, elbows, forearm, wrist, fingers, hands. <sighs> And neck and head. And face. <sighs> okay. And you can break it up as, as far as you want to break it up. Um, and there's two practical applications that I wanted to suggest before we move on. And one is that we hold stress in very predictable places. Um, some people are shoulder stress people and they walk around looking like this all the time. And other people have that kind of, I can't move my neck sort of stress. And a lot of, a lot of jaw stress, a lot of And um, sternum, my heart hurts kind of stuff, indigestion, um, you know, I really don't feel like eating. My stomach's kind of weird sort of thing, which is sometimes is a diaphragm, diaphragmatic press. And sometimes it's a, you know, there's chemical stuff going on in there so that you can get an acid reflux, wrong mix kind of thing going on. So there's lower back, obviously. There's all kinds of places that we hold on to tension and um, inadvertently store stress. And so one of the things you can do is by, by when someone grabs you, for instance, if you can allow the grab and release the structure that they're holding on to, that's one of the ways that you directly connect into their center because they're giving you a line to their core. So they go, ha, and you go, ah, and they go, whoa. Those are the technical terms. And um, so one of the things is that when you, when you notice where stress is being placed and you allow the grab, so to speak, and then you release the structures around and underneath it, you're, you have all kinds of movement. As long as you're not trying to do this, there's all kinds of movement that's possible within it and you can connect through it to somebody else. Similarly, if you've um, injured your wrist, right? And you're, you're, and you're treasuring it and trying not to move it and all that sort of thing. If you leave the wrist exactly the way it is, so you freeze it and you move the fingers without moving the hurt wrist or you move in the skin without doing this, which is what's gonna make the wrist go, ah, then the wrist gets more blood flow, right? It has more options for healing and for relaxing itself so that you can do minor things with it while, while still allowing it to heal. That's one of the things is that jiku, leaving the pivot point in the grab is a psychological, somatic, physical principle. And if I say, <clears throat> you gotta get it done by the deadline by the five o'clock today, if you don't try to change, but that's the deadline, but you move other things around, it makes it more likely that you'll have more choices so that hit the deadline or don't hit the deadline, the thing that you do next is more functional rather than not. And in my experience, it makes me better able to hit the deadline too. Does that make sense? The psychological yeah. answer? Okay. So, Actually, that's a super rich exercise. Thanks for suggesting it. Um, but, um, okay, I, I just, there's a bunch of, I'm, I'm cycling through what's next narratives because we have like 15 minutes left. Um, and sometimes I panic and get luxury at this point and I'm gonna try not to do that. <laughs> um, The most important thing to me is to get the principles of martial nonviolence across so that other people can apply them when we're not face to face. And so that's, I, I wanna say that out loud because that's why I get panicked and start to get luxury. I start to talk about the principles, which ironically is not how you learn. The principles are all operational. So you learn them by moving through them. So I've already, and, and Nathan, you already have done a bunch of this with me anyway. So you, you know kind of what my shtick is. But it's somatic. I'll, I'll briefly say everything communicates. 
to me, to you, to them, to us. And my question is, what message do I want to be sending by into, into my habits by the things that I repeat? And it's not that, for instance, in COVID lockdown, the metaphor lockdown can, starts to apply to everything because it's the dominant narrative. And I get locked down. I, I start to think that I can't get out, that I, I can't escape. It's never going to be over. All those sort of things that are associated with lockdown. And then my body does stuff to make the, the negative things that I am believing more real to my experience. What's going on out there gets reflected in here. What's going on in here gets reflected out there. And so the, the, the benefit of an, a martially nonviolent approach is that everything becomes a training opportunity to see how what I'm repeating is creating habits rather than, um, you know, dominating martially my, you know, because you can't dominate, you know, a pandemic, you, you know. So the challenge is how to shift everything into a training opportunity um, as an exercise so that when you really do get hit with something that's bigger than just my daily dilemmas that everybody is sharing more or less, you are also able, you had the practice enough to be able to shift that into a training opportunity. So the person jumps on you out of the alleyway and you demonstrate Aikido rather than fighting with them, which they'll probably win. So, because they were first and, you know, are probably used to fighting and that sort of thing. So you don't start to fight with them. You just, you show yourself and everybody else Aikido um, in the same way that when someone comes and says, you suck, um, you could say, no, you suck. But if you want other options, what would they be? And then you go practice them. Well, they grab me here, they grab me here, they do this, they do that. And it's the same um, fantasy of practice. It doesn't always work because I find that I don't want to practice. I want to kick some ass sometimes, even my own. And uh, it, that doesn't usually work out well for me or the people around me. I certainly don't like it when they decide it's time to kick ass and I'm on the receiving end of that. So if I want that dynamic to change, the only, one, the only person who's in range to make an argument for changing that is me. I'm the only one I can, I can reach psychologically without considerable work, you know, and then that gets weird. So, um, so I've created structures by which we, our attention is drawn to how we're doing what we're doing. And then um, what, what did you do? What did you expect would happen as a result of that? Is that in fact what happened? Um, I ignored them because I expected them to disengage if I ignored them. I negated them. Don't do that because I thought that would make them stop. I opposed them because I thought that would convert them to my, I actively opposed them rather than just stopping or ignoring them because I thought maybe that would convert them to my point of view. Um, I exaggerated greatly, I hyper hyperbole. You always do, you never do because I thought that would diminish the behavior that I hate so much in them. I redirected them uh, so I could accompany them or imply that I was accompanying them and then not. So they'll be going in that direction instead. I agreed with them because I wanted them to continue stuff like that. So that I'm, I'm mapping the physical vectors for the physics of physical attack. And I'm mapping the psychological vectors of where I thought that was going and where I wanted it to go and how I, the tactics I deployed to make the thing that I think I want more likely an outcome. Um, and then um, I look at counterintuitive and subconscious and even unconscious stuff to say, hey, I wonder if this is that, uh, so that we get um, an, an open window to complexity. Um, and then we do um, Aikido Tai Sabaki. Um, Jiu-Jitsu Tai Sabaki, and we put scripts with it like you've done with me before, um, and then we do techniques, and we look at what the technique implies and whether the technique can be improved by imagining that it's communicating something, and then we go through basic scripts, and then we make them less basic and more improvisational and then just conversational in the same way that you do. You work on yourself at a very basic level that's obviously not self-defense, and then you work on making sure the other person moves when you move and you stay connected, right? And then you do the real self-defense thing. And we do the same thing psychologically from script to sort of in the vicinity where the vectors are maintained. They still have the same direction, but with different language. 
and then you can say whatever you want to say and you're describing and proposing all at the same time as you're in motion. Okay, I think I did that in three minutes or less, but um, <laughs> let me stop talking for a second and check with you and then um, ask if there's anything in particular you'd like to work on. Uh, yeah, that's all that I needed to say, and then I'm wanting to do any of the individual examples of that stuff. Um, and then at the end, I'm gonna suggest um, what might happen next time, because I'd like to add another layer of that. We, we worked on support and structure, and now we're working on place and location. That's our theme for right now. So I'm checking in with you. What are you uh, remembering, retaining, thinking about at the moment? I'm thinking that um, in an Aikido kind of way, uh, this week, it was a sort of invitation to somebody come along with this. And then the response to another thing uh, afterwards was um, hostile a bit in the way of, well, you only invited me because you wanted that. And I feel, violated sort of thing so that my clumsy approach at non-violence really backfired <laughs> so any comments or suggestions for how to resolve stuff like that lovely that, that's what i was that, that's what i'm going to propose um for next time too and we, and we could start is that we actually we bring scripts I said this, they said this, and it could be paraphrased. It could even be fictional because that often yeah. gets at things more directly. But we're, we would we would describe it <clears throat> in terms of what happened and where the where the energy went, what the vectors were like, and then make proposals for a ways ways to interpret it, and then ways to um, respond to it. Various responses that would be possible, and what's the stereotype, and what's you know, the best one that you could just come up with, it's not a stereotype, but it's the best one you come with at the moment, and then take time to really figure out what the most, what an ideal response, as close as we can get, would look like. Um, so I'm definitely happy to go down that path. Um, how about you, Nathan? What are you thinking about? Um, I was thinking about what you just spoke about, and I see a difference, like, for some reason, if it's a physical attack, like, my body sent one part of my, I could sense that with my body and then my brain could analyze that and how to react to it. Also, maybe just because physical training, that's what we do, right? So we, we learn how to do that. But if it's a psychological or emotional attack, for some reason, it's the same part of the brain. So when there's an emotional attack, I don't have that space in my brain to analyze it in the same way if it's a physical attack. If someone were to come at me forward, my body feels forward, my brain thinks of action. But if, let's say, you verbally accost me, my brain says, I'm attacked, but I can't think of any solution to that because it's the same space. So how, I understand what you're trying to do. You're trying to bridge the parallel, like, here goes a metaphor, body, mind, same. I don't really feel that they behave the same or that my mind, isn't as advanced as my body mind connection as my mind mind connection. You said it perfectly. Yeah, and and the body that we haven't we haven't practiced the psychological side of this. Aikido implies that that's what happens, but if you don't practice it, that's not what you do under pressure. And so the challenge it, that that's what that's the that is the question hey, that martial nonviolence is designed to respond to, which is to say, if I'm, I'm more advanced in my body. And if you try to punch me in the face, my body absolutely knows there are nine things I can do, but I'm already in motion. I'm already, I've already picked one and I'm already going. But my brain, since I haven't been encouraged to think about the psychological elements of communication like that, I don't have immediately good habits. I have immediately limited, the same way when I walked into a dojo for the first time as, I don't know, for me, it was like I was eight or nine or something. You know, and I just kind of walked in and went, hey, bam, you know, and you don't, you, and you go, oh, well, I don't want that to happen again. And so you start thinking about, and you slowly go through the process of creating different habits. And in my case, in the case of martial nonviolence, instead of move, move now, as the first thing you, you, you learn, right, 
you do that with your brain. And what I do is describe. So don't decide anything about it. Simply say to yourself, or out loud if they're a willing participant, you say, you describe precisely what's happening. So I come up to you and I say, you know, this is really inadequate work. And your response can be anything at all that is descriptive. And where I start some, being a somatic discipline is, I imagine an arrow of force coming from this person to that person. And I even go so far as to imagine where it hits because this is inadequate work, it hits me right there. That's not a this to me, it's like a gut punch because the, my adequacy is a really big deal and I carry it around in my belly. And the only way that I know to associate that is, I went back and scripted conflicts with people in my head and thought, wow, man, that really, it gave me an upset stomach. It, made, it wasn't that it was hard to breathe, it's not out here. It's kind of in here-ish. It feels like being punched right underneath the sternum. So I go, oh, oh like that. That's an, that's an adequacy issue. And so I'm doing all this fantasy psychological stuff trying to work my way into what my actual felt experience was of their attack. So that next time it happens, the first thing I do is, oh, this is like that, rather than you bastard. And so I am, so my wife says the same thing to me that she said a thousand things for the last, you know, 23 years. And I go, oh, there's that thing, rather than, oh, and it's not, I'm not saying she sucks. I'm saying that, oh, that's the, where she, and then I, and then I can decide whether I do the same thing that I did last time or 10 years ago. And I can notice how they're similar and I can start to think about it. Well, last time it didn't work really well when I just got out of the way because she just ran over me. So I'm gonna like back up and put up my hand. I'm gonna create distance. I'm gonna notice that. And so suddenly I'm in the martial tactical mind and I'm not, um, and I'm in the psychologically tactical mind and I'm not in the same kind of reactive space that I was the first time I walked into the dojo. And I just have to let myself be a beginner at that and think, okay, well, that person has a pretty good habit when they respond to that. What would they do? Sensei, senpai, whatever. That person has a pretty good habit. And I have all of these fantasy people in my head based on things I've actually seen real people do. And it's exactly the same. I'm just in the conflict dojo. And it's exactly the same thing. Well, they didn't get clobbered. How did they do? They sort of, they put out their hands, they backed up, they got off to the side. Huh. And I do exactly the same thing psychologically. So that I, 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 so rather than telling myself, don't do that reactive thing, I substitute something positive for it. And that's the thing I do instead. And all you have to do is describe it. You don't have to operate on it necessarily, or you don't, you definitely don't judge good or bad. You just describe, they said, you suck. And um, it felt like a gut punch. And it really made me go Ooh, like that psychologically. Uh, and then I wanted to hit them back. Or I did, you know, I, I got them back and that didn't work out very well. So, and then I, or I ignored them or I, you know, and you start to describe the interaction as though it were physical, as though it were visualizable. And then your imagination kicks in and then it's a creative process from which you can learn rather than the same old bullshit. Does that make sense? One of the things I, I can't remember if you said it or if I read it this week was about don't put yourself above other people. And then in class on Tuesday night, um, my sensei was um, demonstrating a technique with a um, student who was much bigger and stronger and heavier than him. And I noticed he really dropped low to be able to come up and do the technique. And I thought, oh, that's that thing of not putting yourself above other people that because he's smaller and lighter, he's so much stronger when he's below the other people or humbling himself you could describe it as or you know elevating the other person metaphorically so it's constantly about looking for those metaphors isn't it so um if there's somebody who undeniably is bigger and stronger in a more powerful position than me there's no point in me squaring up to them so i need to not exactly prostrate myself but humble myself and drop down beneath them and then surprise them by popping up 
sort mm -hmm. of thing. So it's, I'm constantly looking for the metaphors and what I don't know, Nathan, what your suggestion is the sort of thing that I've had this very prickly long term relationship with my sister, but the metaphors in Aikido of, well, just go slowly or just step into her place, see what she's looking at, and those sort of connect with her before saying my bit and let her lead the first bit and then lead the work. You know, that's been so hugely, hugely helpful. And um, it has transformed that relationship um, in so much that I feel as though, yep, yeah, okay, I've done everything I can do now and I'm really happy with the relationship. It's not perfect, but I've given my gift offering, whatever you want to call it, openness. And if she chooses to accept it, great. If she doesn't, that's fine too. So yeah, uh, the, the metaphors I find hugely helpful. Yep. And, keep, and keeping intention, if I may, keeping intention the the metaphorical and the literal so that it, it's not it doesn't necessarily we allow the ideas to associate without immediately assuming that um the idea of lowering yourself relative to someone else necessarily has to equate exactly with humility or humbling yourself but you yeah. think about it and you think huh i wonder if that's the tactic i wonder if that works yeah and then and also noticing when you say don't elevate yourself above i would immediately when i give myself instructions don't do that definitely do that my brain immediately goes oh no hang on a second i'm assigning value mm -hmm. when i elevate myself mm -hmm. this is the this is what this is what happened which is likely yeah. to happen when i when I lower myself, this yeah. is like, do I want that effect? Do I want this effect? Because every time I tell myself, don't or do, do the, especially the very first reaction, it's almost always weird. <laughs> um, and so the question is how to keep the creative mind open so that as you're choosing tactics, you continue to see them as options and tactics and not something that you always have to do necessarily. Always respond to a punch in the fun. Nah, nah. It's when, when they punch, if they punch high, you know, if they're taller, yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe it makes sense to go down. That, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So you're putting them in, you're categorizing them and moving them around and thinking about them. Because otherwise we end up getting a little too new agey and a little too not um, non-practical when we if start imagining that the metaphorical and the literal are, are can be directly equated rather than one suggesting ways to look at the other. Yes, possibility An strategy rather than a literal equivalence. Yeah. So let's see. Okay, we're, we should stop. Um, so please, next time, please bring a script. Please, and, and it needs to be as simple as you would read it in a children's book. So rather than Proust, we're looking for a C spot run kind of script. Um, you did wrong. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. I, I'll never do it again. Or leave me alone. Or, you know, that's so, so we can just, because we're going to start pretty simple and we're going to vector it. You know, where did they go and where did I go and how did I respond? And then we're going to talk about the options and then we'll allow it to get a little more complicated um, so that we can just get with, the, with that program. Is, is the script from start to conclusion or just the initial impetus? Uh, sure. <laughs> um, I'm, I mean, if, as long as it's simple. Yeah. 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 I mean, it could you could just be summarizing as well. They generally said, change what you're doing. And I generally said, no way in hell. And they generally said, do it or there's going to be consequences. And I generally said, bring it. Or you know, so, or you can make it more specific. I mean, part of the thing is getting the idea, getting your own sense of how the script should work so that you get how you're framing things. So you can turn up the complexity and you can turn it down to get simpler until you understand it. Um, because being able to describe it is the, is the most important thing at this stage. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay. Ready? Domo arigato gozaimashita. See you Thanks, next guys. time. Yeah. Have a great week. Thanks, Thanks very much. Too. I'm gonna Bye go man. teach the I'm gonna go teach the kids in family class. I'll see you guys later. All right. Bye, Bye. now. Bye.